King Thrushbeard. Once there was a king who had two sons, a very good and very fine older son, and a very, very beautiful younger son. The younger son imagined himself a queen and dressed himself in gowns of the finest, rarest silk that was like spun smooth as butter and wafted around his thin frame, his fine clavicle, his willowy waist, his limbs moving like a cat in a breeze, and his gorgeous fine face. And he would waft through the castle, trailing beauty and amazement behind him, as all would look on him with sighs, having witnessed beauty incarnate. But he knew he was beautiful, and it gave him an outsized sense of pride. He was so proud, it was so strong in him, and he wore it and used it on people. He used it to get what he wanted, he used it to have his way, he used it to make others feel less. His father, when he came of age, knew it was time to marry him, and his father arranged suitors from all of the surrounding kingdoms to come and court his son, the princess. And each one, the princess's pride, caused him to critique because they couldn't possibly be up to his standards. And so with every single one, no matter how good they were, how wealthy, how powerful, how kind, how handsome in their own right, he found a physical flaw and compared it to his own perfection and used it to send them away. That one was too tubby. That one was stick-thin. That one was obnoxiously muscly. That one was too tall. That one was too short. That one was dully average-heighted. That one had too much hair. That one had too little hair, none at all. And that one had disastrously normal hair. And away they were sent. Until they were running out of suitors. And the king finally said, there is one more, one. You will see this one, and I defy you to find a flaw. And in came this handsome young prince. And the princess, the king's son, looked him up and down. And it was hard to find a flaw, for he was pretty stunning. But the princess settled on the pointed beard of the young prince and said, Your beard is pointed in the same shape as the beak of a thrush. You look like a little birdie beak. Tweet, tweet, tweet. I name you King Thrushbeard, and you are not for me. Go away. King Thrushbeard left humiliated. And the king was furious! And he said, my son, you will marry the next beggar that comes to the palace. I vow. And the princess quaked in her chiffon silken robes. And that afternoon, a minstrel, a begging musician, came and played his lute outside the windows of the palace in hopes to gather some alms from the king. And the king heard the music and he urged the minstrel beggar to come in and to play for the court. And the minstrel played upon his lute with his little shabby hood and scraggly beard and played beautifully. And when the song was done, the king said, let us all give this wonderful musician alms, money for his artistry. And, my friend, I have news for you. To honor the music which has delighted us, I give you my son the princess's hand in marriage. 
And the princess was horrified, and she dropped to her father's feet, and he said, Please, father, do not marry me to a beggar. I am too fine and not made for this life. Please, father. And the king said, Enough. I made a vow. You will go with your new husband. And he brought out the priest, and the priest in his wine-red robes and finery performed the wedding ceremony. And the princess was married to the beggar. And they took off his fine robes and gowns. And he put on a simple frock. And his husband said, Cheer up, my beautiful wife. It is not so bad living with me. There will always be music. And out from the castle they went. The king's youngest son, now dressed in a simple cotton dress, and his husband, the minstrel, the beggar, with a scraggly beard and the tattered clothing. And as they walked out of the kingdom, they stepped towards this great forest with huge trees of pine and oak. And the young princess said, Oh, husband, whose great forest is this so dark and fine? And his husband said, Oh, this forest belongs to King Thrushbeard, and it might have been thine. And the young princess said, I've been young and foolish. I am afeard. Oh, that I had accepted this King Thrushbeard. And after they had passed the great forest, there was a huge meadow with green swaying grass and little flowers, buttercups and butterflies drinking from each. And it went on for miles. And the young princess said, Husband, whose field and meadow is this so sublime? And her husband said, This meadow belongs to King Thrushbeard, and it might have been thine. And the king's youngest son said, I have been young and stupid, I'm afeard. Would that I had accepted King Thrushbeard. They walked on, finally passing the meadow, and there was a great city with tall, noble buildings and gorgeous architecture built by clever men. And the young princess said, Husband, whose shining city is this so fine? And her husband said, This great city belongs to King Thrushbeard and it might have been thine. And the young princess said, I have been young and silly. I am afeard. Would that I had accepted this king Thrushbeard. And they walked past the city, past the little houses around it, until there were only muddy fields, and in a little bend in the road there was a small cottage that had been patched together out of scraps and she said oh husband whose whose hut is this i i'm afraid to ask because i'm afraid i know and her husband said my wife this is your home and they went in and as they had traveled all day it was night and they slept and in the morning the beggar minstrel said my beautiful wife my fine princess boy I do not make enough as a minstrel and sometimes a handyman to support both of us, and now that there's two living here, you must work also. Let me give you, ah, yes, a way to earn money. You can weave baskets and sell them in the marketplace. Here are the reeds that you may use. And as the young princess took up the reeds and started to learn how to weave them together into baskets, the edges of the reeds cut his delicate skin, for he was unused to work, and his skin was so fine. And as they cut the flesh, his husband said, No, 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 no. Clearly that is not work for you. Let me find you something else. Ah, yes, ah, yes. 
You know fashion. Let's have you spin. You can make fine cloth to sell in the market. And he showed him a spinning wheel and how to spin the thread. But the thread was so fine and it cut the princess's fingers and her delicate skin. And so the husband said, taking his princess's hands in his and trying to stop the bleeding, alas, this is not work for you either. I must find something that will not... Ah, clay is soft. Let us teach you to make pots, and you can make the pots, we will fire them in a kiln, and you can take the pots to market and sell them in the marketplace. And this is what they did. And the princess learned to make the pots, and the clay was soft, maybe just grainy enough to start to toughen his skin. And he learned to make these simple pots out of clay on the wheel. And then they fired them in a hot kiln, and they became solid, useful clay pots. Well, after they had made several dozens, the wife, the former princess, gathered them up and stacked them and carried them to the marketplace, where he set out a blanket and put the pots on the blanket in a corner, an unoccupied corner of the marketplace, where he thought they would be a little out of the way. No sooner had he settled down before even selling a pot, when a knight on a huge charger, a great steed, came riding full on into the marketplace, straight into the pots, and the hooves of the giant horse shattered every single pot. And the princess was left with nothing. And he picked himself up in his simple cotton dress and walked home. And his husband, who was restringing his lute, looked up and said, Why are you home? And, oh, you must have sold everything. You have brought nothing back. And his wife, he said, My husband, A knight on a steed rode into them and shattered every one. I'm not good enough even to make pots and sell them in the marketplace. What use am I? When I was younger and a princess, I was at least an ornament. And now I am nothing. I am nothing. I'm not even useful. And his husband took him in his arms and said, Do not weep. I know something that may be a little closer. Your father, the king, I have heard, is looking for help in the kitchens. They need a maid in the kitchens. Let's go tomorrow and see if they will take you in. And so they went on the next day back to his father's castle. And sure enough, the head chef welcomed him back and said, you will be a kitchen maid. And so you will need to scrub these floors and you will need to clean those pots and you will need to clean the pans and you will need to chip out the butter that's been cooked on when we were making caramel with sugar and you will need to order everything and chop the vegetables and scoop out the fireplace and the former princess accepted all of this and got right to work and in the evenings he would strap a belt with two little pouches for two little pots and in those pots they would put any leftover soup and stew from the meal. And so he brought home any of the leftovers from his father's palace back to his beggar husband in their little shack, and they would eat the leftovers. And this is how they lived. And one great day, there was a feast and a party celebrating the maturity of his older brother, the prince. And all the nobles came in all their finery, and it was beautiful. There was music and dancing and a huge feast. And he helped prepare the feast, and he worked, worked, and worked until the last dish was served. And then having some time before it was time to go home, he filled his pots with leftovers from the feast, 
to carry home, and he snuck up into a stairway, and right in a little corner in the entranceway to the great hall, to just observe his former life as it danced and ate in all its glory, a glory denied him, for he was no longer the princess. And as he turned to go, one more guest was announced. And he turned and looked, and sweeping past him in a great cape was King Thrushbeard. And King Thrushbeard walked right past, and his cape swooped over the little scullery maid and tipped him over, and he fell down the stairs into the hall, the great hall, the shining hall, onto the floor with the dancers, and his pots spilled out all of the soup and the leftovers and spilled it onto his cotton raggedy dress, and he was laying in the middle of the muck of the stew, and all the courtiers pointed at the forlorn little kitchen maid and laughed and laughed and laughed. And the princess wept for hum her humiliation. But King Thrushbeard came to her and said, Do not weep. And the kitchen maid princess looked up at King Thrushbeard and said, O oh, great sire, how I am brought low before you. I should have treated you so much better. I should have given you my heart and my loyalty and myself. But I was haughty and arrogant, and I gave you attitude. And my attitude has earned me my humiliation. And I have earned it well. And King Thrushbeard took him and lifted him up and said, Do not weep, for you are my wife. I am your beggar minstrel husband, and after you refused me with your arrogance, I devised a plan because I knew, I saw, that there was good in you, but that your pride must be sheared off, and so I made a plan to become your minstrel husband. And he held the young princess in his arms. And he brought out a beautiful golden dress with powder blue trimmings, and he took his little wife away, and they dressed him in this gorgeous shimmering gown. And they came back out onto the dance floor, and the princess's father embraced his son. And his older brother embraced his younger brother, the princess. And the king, Thrushbeard, and his wife danced the night away. And when they went home in a golden carriage, they went to sleep in King Thrushbeard's great castle. And she served him as his queen. And she was a noble queen. Because not only did she serve her royal duties with the noble, nobles of the court, but she also looked after everyone in the kingdom, especially the poor. And if there was one family who was going without food, she would go down to the kitchen and fill clay pots with food and carry them in her gilded carriage to the home of that family where she would walk to the door with the pots of food in her hands and give them into the hands of those who needed. And all in her kingdom were well. Remember to look past the circumstance of each person and see the good in all, rich and poor, 
noble and arrogant. See the good in everyone, and especially see the good in yourself.